as we have some neighbors um, outside the window right now who are peeking in. So in case they start knocking, I'll wait a I second. saw shadows on the wall behind you. <laughs> yeah. It happens a couple times a day. Where I am, there's typically not anybody in this building at the train station in Lakeside. So yeah. everyone peeks in and does <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, we'll get going then. Ready? Sure. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again for joining us in our final program with Dr. Katherine Jellison as we are celebrating our 19th Amendment um, anniversary week here at Lakeside Chautauqua. My name is Dakota Harkins, and I'm the Director of Education and Heritage Programming here at Lakeside. Uh, we will be recording and um, you can view all of the programs that are happening this week since we have almost double what we typically do. And they'll all be available on Facebook and also on the Lakeside Ohio calendar. Um, we've had a lot of questions about those. So make sure that you check that out later on in the week if you aren't able to join us live now. But I would love to turn it over again to Dr. Katherine Jellison who is here for after the amendment this afternoon, um, she's had a couple wonderful programs introducing the suffrage movement and all of the characters and actors in that movement throughout the years. So um, welcome, Dr. Jellison. Thank you. And thank you again for inviting me and thank you for being a wonderful hostess uh, for my three previous presentations. I'm going to pull up my screen here. Let's see. There we go, after the amendment. Well, if people tuned into my lecture this morning, we had ended with uh, the 19th Amendment becoming part of the Constitution. It was on this day, uh, August 18th, 100 years ago, uh, that by a margin of one vote, the Tennessee House of Representatives ratified the 19th Amendment making uh, the requisite three-fourths of the U.S. states uh, confirming the suffrage amendment. And we see the headline here in the Lowell, Massachusetts newspaper, suffrage wins. Tennessee House ratifies federal amendment, giving women of entire nation vote this fall. So uh, August 18th, 1920. Tennessee ratifies federal amendment giving women of entire nation vote this fall. But was that really true? Did the 19th Amendment give women across the nation, all women, the right to vote? Well, there were large groups of women that actually were not enfranchised by the 19th Amendment. Most Native American women were not enfranchised by the 19th Amendment because most Native Americans were not made U.S. citizens and therefore entitled to the right to vote uh, for another four years. It was not until the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924 that granted citizenship to all uh, American Indians that Native American women uh, even had uh, the hope of being able to be voters. The woman you see here in the photograph is a woman named Ruth Muskrat Bronson. She was uh, a graduate of Mount Holyoke uh, and therefore, you know, an educated woman, an activist, an activist on behalf of women's rights and also Native American rights. And here we see her in traditional dress. She was a, a Cherokee from Oklahoma, uh, wearing traditional dress, meeting with President Calvin Coolidge shortly before he signs into law the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924. And she's handing him uh, a book there as a gift. Uh, so in 1920, with the 19th Amendment, most women uh, of indigenous background ancestry were not allowed the right to vote. And even after uh, the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924, in many states uh, in the Union, particularly um, in various Southwestern states, uh, because voting 
uh, rules and practices are determined on the state level. There were several uh, southwestern states that set up impediments to Native Americans voting, sort of similar to the Jim Crow rules of the American Southeast at this time. So it won't be until well after World War II, as a matter of fact, that all women of Native American ancestry uh, would be granted the right to vote because um, they were impeded at the state level in some locations. Asian immigrant women also will be not uh, allowed the right to vote with the 19th Amendment because Asian immigrants were not allowed to become naturalized citizens. So the women in this photograph, um, this is in the early 1920s in San Francisco, these Asian immigrant women were not granted the right to vote with the 19th Amendment because they were not allowed to become naturalized US citizens. Again, a post-World War II uh, phenomenon uh, will allow people who have immigrated from Asia to become citizens and therefore ultimately become voters. It's not until 1946 that Filipinas and South Asians from the Indian subcontinent are allowed to become naturalized citizens. And for women of East Asian ancestry, like the women in this photograph, it won't be until 1952 that people who have immigrated from East Asia, from China, Japan, Korea, uh, will be allowed the opportunity to become naturalized citizens. If you wanna know the names of those laws, the 1946 Aaron Walter Act that allows East Asian immigrants to become citizens. So these are two groups of women who are not granted, uh, are not granted citizenship, yes, that's correct, and therefore not granted voting rights uh, by the 19th Amendment. Um, this is a better known story, I'm sure. Most African-American women are not granted suffrage with the 19th Amendment because most African-American women still reside in the American South where state and local laws have been passed that prevent most blacks from voting. Now, simultaneously here in 1920, with the ratification of the 19th Amendment, we see uh, something called the Great Migration beginning, which is uh, a large scale movement of African Americans out of the rural South into the urban North. So women who participated in the Great Migration, which uh, you know, basically occurs uh, from World War I through World War II, um, possibly could benefit from the 19th Amendment. So uh, African American women who moved to the North where black voting rights were recognized, the 19th Amendment uh, could apply to them. So this is an extended family uh, moving out of the South to Chicago in 1922. And so the adult women in this particular family, once they got up to Chicago, um, could have the right to vote. But what about uh, their relatives and friends who remain in the South? Well, Southern black women will not be uh, allowed full voting rights until um, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So it's a full 45 years after the 19th Amendment before uh, Southern Black women will have the right to vote. And most Latinas also will not have the right to vote. At this point in 1920, uh, most women of, of uh, Latin American heritage are living in the Southwestern US. And uh, we see here with some signage from the era that the kinds of uh, segregation that occurred in the Southeast, segregating of whites and blacks is also occurring in the Southwest, segregating Anglos and uh, people of Latin American ancestry. And this um, applied to voting rights as well, that the same kinds of state level prohibitions against black voting in the Southeast 
apply to people of Latin American ancestry. Uh, today, of course, the term we would use was, would be Latinx. Uh, Latinx people in the Southwest uh, were largely prevented from voting by what we would recognize today as blatantly discriminatory uh, state level laws. Now, uh, if a person of uh, Latin American ancestry was born in the US, according to the 14th Amendment that I talked about yesterday, they automatically have citizenship. Here in the Southwest at this time, uh, certainly we had uh, people of uh, Latin heritage who were born in the US and are citizens, but because of these discriminatory voting laws at the state level, they're not allowed to vote. And then of course, we also have immigrants from Latin America, most obviously from Mexico. And uh, because they weren't citizens, um, they couldn't vote. Uh, and if they attempted to become naturalized citizens, then, uh, well, sometimes that was certainly not encouraged. And those laws that prevented people of Latin ancestry from voting would be applied once uh, Latin immigrants became citizens. And by the time this photograph is taken, the woman at the right and her children uh, who had immigrated from Mexico, um, by the time we get to the Great Depression era, by the early 1930s, many immigrants from Latin America are being deported back, in this case, to Mexico because there is a great deal of concern about Mexican and other Latin American immigrants competing with whites, Anglo Americans for jobs during the depression. Um, so we see a great deal of discrimination against native born um, women of Latin ancestry as well as Latin American immigrant women during this time. So. When we talk about the 19th Amendment giving voting rights to American women, we have to recognize that we are primarily talking about white women. For all that the suffrage movement began in the mid 19th century with a commitment uh, to racial equality as well as gender equality through a series of events that I talked about in my subsequent lectures, my lecture yesterday afternoon and this morning, um, that emphasis on all women and that emphasis on white women as well as women of color uh, deserving the right to vote, that has uh, oftentimes been misplaced. So that headline in uh, the Lowell, Massachusetts newspaper didn't quite get it right. It's not uh, that women throughout the nation are granted the right to vote with the 19th Amendment. Women of color are largely left out of the equation and it won't be until the post-World War II era that we begin to see that situation rectified. But what about those women uh, that the 19th Amendment does enfranchise white adult citizen women. What does suffrage mean for the women who are enfranchised like these women voting uh, in the election of 1920? Well, I want to share with you the experiences of three different reformers uh, this afternoon, women who were suffragists, uh, some names I already shared with you in my comments this morning, two of the three names. And uh, they were women who certainly worked for suffrage, but they didn't see suffrage as an end in itself. They saw it as a beginning. And they hoped that once women had the right to vote, uh, they would change the world with the elective franchise. And it was just the first step in changing um, the rules of their world, uh, the post-World War I American world, in a way that would benefit women of the US. The first woman I want to introduce you to, a name you haven't heard yet, is this woman, Crystal Eastman. And Crystal Eastman was a suffragist. She was a member of the National Woman's Party that I talked about this morning. 
that most radical segment of uh, the 20th century suffrage movement. She had many claims to fame, as well as being a well-known suffragist and uh, affiliate of the National Women's Party. She's a co-founder of the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU. She is uh, a journalist. She and her brother Max Eastman publish a periodical called The Liberator. And after that election of 1920, right, uh, 19th Amendments, August 1920, then in November we have the first election uh, that women are able to participate in in large scale numbers, uh, although again, predominantly white women. And now it's December 1920. And in The Liberator, the radical periodical that she and her brother Max publish, uh, Crystal Eastman uh, presents an essay that she entitles, Now We Can Begin. I think that is a very instructive title, Now We Can Begin. The vote is just the first point. Now we can begin to remake American society in a way um, that benefits women. In this essay, Now We Can Begin, she sets out a four-point agenda for achieving, as she calls it, women's freedom. Now that the majority, the white majority, have achieved suffrage. Um, so I want to share with you some of uh, Crystal Eastman's words from that essay of December 1920. She says, most women will agree that the day when the Tennessee legislature finally enacted the federal suffrage amendment is a day to begin with, not a day to end with. Now they can say what they are really after and what they are after in common with all the rest of the struggling word, world is freedom. And then she says, freedom is a large word. So Eastman lists four items that she sees as remaining barriers between women and true freedom. The first, and she says chief among the remaining barriers is inequality in pay. That women are not paid uh, equally to men. You will find in my comments this afternoon, I will mention a number of issues that will sound very contemporary to us. A number of issues that are still on uh, the women's movement agenda a hundred years later. So inequality of pay. And um, I was talking with Dakota earlier today about it being about a year ago uh, that I was invited to give uh, these series of lectures yesterday and today. And I remember at that time, uh, it was in all of the newspapers and on the internet and on television uh, about the US women's soccer team demanding equal pay with the men's soccer team. Here is the US uh, women's soccer team, the premier women's soccer team in the world uh, certainly with a better record of performance than the men's soccer team, the U.S. men's team, and yet the male soccer players were getting paid more than the women. Um, and we could take uh, that one example and expand it um, by dozens and dozens and dozens of similar examples in which uh, women's work is not paid uh, equally with men's work. And Crystal Eastman is already raising that important issue here in December 1920. She says the chief remaining barrier between women and true freedom is this, as she calls it, inequality in pay with men. The second issue she addresses in her 1920 essay. Second, she said, we must institute a revolution in the early training and education of both boys and girls. And she said, 
in her famous essay. She knew society would be even more resistant to this reform than to the reform of paying men and women equal wages. She said both in formal education in the schoolroom and in socialization at home, boys and girls should be taught the same skills. Boys and girls needed to be socialized to perform the same tasks. Boys and girls should both expect to grow up to be wage earners and both boys and girls uh, should know how to run a household. Uh, from a young age, boys and girls should be taught the same skills, the same skills in the classroom, the same skills in the kitchen. Um, and of course, we again see the white middle class bias of uh, the women's movement in 1920. She's talking about um, the white middle class, uh, people uh, who had a family wage that was large enough that men could primarily be the wage earners and women the homemakers. For working class families and certainly for most families of color, this would not be the situation. Perhaps all members of the family had to be employed at least part time to survive economically, but she's speaking from her own white middle class perspective. Um, she said that only through similar socialization would boys and girls grow up to be men and women who shared housekeeping duties at the end of a day of paid employment, rather than leaving it solely to the woman uh, to do all the housework. And she was referring to uh, what today we might call the second shift or the double burden, the idea even as late as 2020, and you know all the sociological data show this, uh, that women in uh, households that uh, contain both men and women, that it is predominantly the women who do the majority of the housework and have more of the domestic responsibilities. Well, what Crystal Eastman is envisioning is a world in which in which both men and women are wage earners and of course are earning uh, an equal wage and they've both come home at the end of the day and it isn't a second shift or a double burden just for the woman, uh, that men will do their share of the housework. Um, and she says only if boys and girls are, are educated and socialized from the very beginning learning the same lessons, learning the same skills, will we prevent the situation that she sees all around her in 1920, uh, perhaps as seen in her own two marriages, and uh, perhaps in the household she grew up in because both her mother and father were congregational ministers. And so when they came back to the parsonage at the end of the day, when both of them had perhaps been visiting uh, parishioners uh, and came back to the home, uh, there at the congregational parsonage, it was her mom who cooked the meals, who swept the carpet, etc. She said, it, "But we have to, we have to nip this in the bud when uh, boys and girls are young, and they need to be socialized in a similar way. Because then, if that isn't the case, they will grow up to be men and women who believe this old-fashioned idea uh, that." Domestic responsibilities are strictly women's responsibilities. She said this in her uh, Now We Can Begin essay of 1920. The average man has a carefully cultivated ignorance about household matters, from what to do with the crumbs to the grocer's telephone number, a sort of cheerful inefficiency which protects him. She said men will claim, well, I can't sweep up those crumbs from the dinner table. And oh my gosh, I can't call the grocer and have the uh, groceries delivered. I forgot that phone number. Uh, I just don't know how to do these household stuff. These household, uh, this household stuff, these household uh, jobs and tasks. I just don't know how to do them. Well, she said, men won't be able to plead ignorance anymore if we enact this reform that I'm proposing that from a young age, boys and girls, uh, learn all the same kinds of things and are socialized similarly. The third item on her agenda, uh, now that we are in the post-suffrage era, so uh, equal wage, um, 
socializing to have the same knowledge base and skills base. Um, we also need to have voluntary motherhood. We have to, in the post suffrage era, recognize that women will not have freedom until they can control their fertility. Again, reading her words, freedom of any kind for women is hardly worth considering unless it is assumed that they will know how to control the size of their families. Birth control is just as elementary and essential in our propaganda as equal pay. So uh, along with calling for equal pay, equal socialization of boys and girls, women have to be able to control their fertility. Birth control must be on our post suffrage agenda. Finally, her fourth point, when women did become voluntarily pregnant, the government should pay them a stipend for their time out of the labor force. The time out of the labor force taken up by giving birth to children, uh, nursing children and caring for young children. The government should pay women uh, to give birth and to raise their young children. Um, only in that way will men and women continue uh, to not have that wage gap. Uh, men can have children and remain continuously in the labor force. Women, if they have children, cannot do that. So we have to make that a level playing field. Women need to be monetarily compensated um, for giving birth to and nurturing young children. This is, again, Crystal Eastman's language. With a generous endowment of motherhood provided by legislation, with all laws against voluntary motherhood and education in its method repealed, with the feminist ideal of education accepted in home and school, and with all special barriers removed in every field of human activity, there is no reason why woman should not become almost a human being. Now that we've got the vote, my four point plan, equal education, equal pay, voluntary motherhood, government stipend for becoming a mother, only then can women have true equality in our society. Only then can women be recognized as equally human with men. Well, a hundred years later, and I would argue that those first three items have only partially been achieved. And item four, you don't even hear much discussion about it anymore. Certainly we have paid maternity leave uh, in the private sector, but government payments uh, to American women uh, for their motherhood, um, you don't hear uh, anyone in a serious role of leadership really discussing that much anymore. It was something uh, discussed in the 60s, 70s, even in the 80s, but I haven't heard discussion of, of that issue for quite some time, government payment uh, to mothers. So that's Crystal Eastman's experience in the post-suffrage decade. These are the things that have to happen for true equality to emerge in our post-suffrage world. Uh, certainly by the time we get to the end of the post-suffrage decade, or even in our own time, uh, those goals of Crystal Eastman's have not been achieved. Assistance to mothers, which obviously was one of Crystal Eastman's concerns, was also the concern of Jeanette Rankin, pictured here. I spoke about her this morning, for those of you who were in attendance this morning. She was the first woman elected to the US Congress, elected to the US House of Representatives in 1916 from the state of Montana. Montana had granted women suffrage before the 19th Amendment, and so women could vote in Montana and women could run for office even before the 19th Amendment becomes part of the U.S. Constitution. 
and she is elected to Congress uh, the same year that President Wilson is reelected to the presidency. Jeanette Rankin is um, very much considering herself a representative of all American women in this important role she has as the first female member of Congress. She's a Republican um, from um, the very Republican state of Montana. And she is a pacifist. Crystal Eastman was a pacifist. Uh, Jeanette Rankin was a pacifist. Uh, the woman I will be talking about subsequently this afternoon um, and that I talked about uh, this morning as well, Alice Paul was also a pacifist. This was a very common uh, belief among suffragists that um, they were also committed pacifists, not all of them, but there was a significant segment who were. And so when she is elected to Congress, uh, we have someone in Jeanette Rankin who has been active in the suffrage movement who says, I uh, will continue to act, act <laughs> to be an activist uh, for other women's right to vote. She certainly will back the 19th Amendment. Um, she backs uh, the idea of the US staying out of the Great War or World War I. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, but she is also very concerned about maternal and infant health. This was an issue on the minds of many suffragists. Uh, and one of the reasons why, particularly those associated with the National American Woman Suffrage Association that I talked about this morning, um, that branch of the suffrage movement here in the 20th century, for most of the 20th century was using what I referred to this morning as um, the social housekeeping argument in favor of women's suffrage. If women have the right to vote, they can use that vote to bring about reforms in American society that will benefit all of society and especially women and children. So Jeanette Rankin proposes uh, during her stint in the House that the US government support a series of clinics and visiting nurses who will help improve uh, the nation's maternal and infant health. It's on July 1st, 1918, that uh, Jeanette Rankin introduces what is essentially the nation's first social welfare bill, this proposed law that would give federal, federal funds for improving maternal and infant care. Unfortunately, however, she introduces the bill in July, July 1st, 1918, by the time uh, the election of 1918 rolls around in November, uh, she's no longer in a position uh, to shepherd that bill into becoming a law. When the US has uh, declared war on Germany back in April of 1917, of course, Congress uh, has the war making powers. And when President Wilson called for a declaration of war against Germany in 1917, Congress had to authorize that uh, call to war in order uh, for the US to become involved. And although there were about uh, 50 uh, male members of Congress who voted against the US going to war against Germany, it was the one female member of Congress, Jeanette Rankin, uh, who votes with that minority of congressional members who votes against US entry in World War I, US entry into the Great War. Uh, she was true to her pacifist beliefs. No, I will not compromise my principles, even though it may be the politically popular thing to do. She votes against US entry into World War I and the voters of Montana really never forgave her. So by the time the uh, uh, election of 1918 rolls around, uh, there has been a uh, reorganization of congressional seats in uh, the state of Montana. 
Um, it's a little bit of a comp complicated situation, but uh, Montana had had two at-large seats uh, rather than having two geographically centered seats in the House of Representatives. And between her election as uh, one of those at-large uh, representatives in 1916 and the 1918 election, the state of Montana had set up geographically designated districts. And her place of residence was in um, a now physically set congressional district uh, that was heavily democratic in what was largely a Republican state, but it was that region of, of the state that had um, a high population of Democratic voters, and um, that was not in her favor to run for that seat, and she knew that, and she also knew that she had gotten so much backlash against voting, um, backlash about voting against U.S. entry into the war, and particularly very misogynistic uh, comments had been made. Oh, this is what you get when you elect a woman to Congress. She's not tough enough. She was, you know, too weak to vote for war against Germany. So she knows if she runs for reelection in what is now not a very uh, safe district for her that she, she will not be reelected. So instead she runs for the Senate, runs for one of the two US Senate seats out of Montana and um, is a, a very unpopular candidate for that seat and loses it. So um, she will not be a member of Congress by the time the bill that she has proposed will become law. Um, a, a, little, a little bit more information about Jeanette Rankin. Um, her timing was not great. She remains a political activist after she is no longer in Congress after 1918. Um, but she doesn't run uh, for political office again until the election of 1940. She runs again for a house seat out of Montana. She wins, I guess people had forgiven her uh, for her vote back in 1917 about going to war with Germany. And she's back in the House of Representatives, uh, elected in 1940, just in time for December 7th, 1941 to roll around. And uh, now President Roosevelt asked Congress to declare war against Japan. And of all the members of the House and the Senate, only one member, only one member votes against declaring war on Japan in the aftermath of Pearl Harbor, and that's Jeanette Rankin. She certainly remains true to her principles. And that is, of course, the death knell uh, for her political career. In terms of elective office, she um, never tries to run for elective office uh, at the congressional level again, because she knows that this, if, if her vote against World War I was unpopular, being the only person to vote against declaring war against Japan and US entry into World War II is very, very, very unpopular. Um, so she has uh, only two terms in com uh, Congress, widely separated from one another, uh, and her pacifism uh, ends each of those. Uh, terms in office, perhaps prematurely. But again, she said, I have to be true to my principles and felt that um, part of her pacifism was tied in uh, to her feminism. That if women didn't speak out against war, who would? Um, of course, after the US declares war on Japan in 1941, then uh, Congress is asked to declare war on Japan's allies. Uh, the Axis powers, uh, Italy and Germany, and um, she doesn't uh, vote against doing that, but she abstains. Uh, so again, true to her principles.
Anyway, that first time she voted against war, uh, here at the World War I era, costs her political uh, office at that time. So she has to rely on a couple of male members uh, of Congress to make her proposed bill for maternal and infant care a law. And it will be Senator Morris Shepard of Texas and Congressman Horace Mann Towner of Iowa, who will sponsor the bill that then will be named for them, the Shepard Towner Act. Um, by the end of 1920, the bill is certainly attracting a lot of attention from the newly enfranchised female voters. And here's a pamphlet that sets out um, what the goals of this bill, uh, which will soon become law the following year, 1921, the Shepherd Towner Act. This pamphlet uh, has some very dramatic language going on here. First of all, the pamphlet shows wide uh, support by the major women's organizations of the era. If you look here at the language at the right uh, hand side, um, here in the first year that the 19th century is operating, 1920, um, we have various important women's organizations and the leading uh, lights of those organizations, the leaders of those organizations going on record, we support uh, this bill. We see the Genera General Federation of Women's Clubs supporting the bill, the YWCA, the PTA, the National Consumers League, the League of Women Voters, uh, that National Association um, uh, for Women's, uh, the, the National Women's Suffrage Association, the N, I'm confusing myself here, the National American Woman Suffrage Association, the NAWSA. Uh, upon achievement of the 19th century, the NAWSA, led by Carrie Chapman Catt, whom I spoke about this morning, it becomes the League of Women Voters. Ah, we've achieved women's suffrage. Now let's educate the new woman voter. And so uh, after achievement of the 19th Amendment, the NAWSA becomes the League of Women Voters and the League of Women Voters supports this bill for maternal and infant care, federally funded maternal and infant care. The WCTU, the Women's Christian Temperance Union endorses the bill. The Public Health Nurses Organization, the Women's Trade Union League, the Women's Bureau of the Democratic National Committee, the Women's Committee of the National Republican Congressional Committee. So it has bipartisan support from the new woman voter. And what will this proposed legislation achieve? Well, as the pamphlet notes, uh, the US has a very poor record at this time of uh, maternal and infant health. The pamphlet notes that in 1918, 23,000 US mothers died from causes related to childbirth and that annually 250,000 infants were dying. The total mother and infant deaths, as this pamphlet notes, was three times the number of US battle deaths in the Great War. And the dramatic language here you see on the left that ends the pamphlet. How long are you going to let mothers and babies die? So there is widespread support, bipartisan support, uh, by the newly enfranchised woman voter. Maybe she's going to those League of Women Voter meetings. Well, now that I'm a voter, I need to become a well-informed woman voter. Tell me all about this proposed law uh, that would give federal money to improve maternal and infant health. That's something that I, as the newly enfranchised woman, I can get behind that. 
widespread support among women voters. But women voters have never been a monolith. This was something that opponents of women's suffrage had warned would be the case, especially the liquor interests, because remember, women's suffrage had been very closely tied to the temperance movement. And the liquor industry had been one of the major uh, funders of the anti-suffrage campaign. Oh, if you give women the vote, they'll all vote alike and they'll all vote dry, which was the slang term for uh, would vote against the alcohol industry. But that monolith never emerged. Not all women thought alike and not all women voted alike. So there were some new women voters who did not support this uh, brainchild of Jeanette Rankin, what becomes the Shepherd Towner Act of 1921. Um, speaking December 7th, as I was a minute ago, but it's December 7th, 1920, uh, we have a letter from a woman named May C. Mitchell, right? This is the year of women's suffrage, late in the year, same month, December 1920, that Crystal Eastman had published her essay. We see this newly enfranchised woman, May C. Mitchell, uh, Baltimore, writing her congressman, J. Charles Linthicum, and she writes him to oppose this bill two-page letter, a letter that relies very heavily on um, elitist, pronatalist language um, and plays up some very traditional ideas. And this is uh, the closing language of May C. Mitchell's letter to her congressman. Motherhood is a sacred institution and not a public one. So let motherhood remain in the seclusion it now has. Comfort of home treatment and privacy of physicians selected by oneself and relieve the government of any excess taxation which would ensue from the passage of a bill desired by some women of the country, few of whom are mothers. And I dare say a canvas would reveal that those working for the bill rarely give birth to more than one child. It is the real mothers that count. And I guess in Mrs. Mitchell's estimation, a real mother has to have more than one child. Um, she is voicing women's opposition, the woman voters opposition to this bill. In language that should strike us as fairly familiar, it reminds me a lot of the uh, language that opponents of Obamacare used, right? I want to be able to choose my own physician. Uh, I want to make my uh, personal health care choices. I don't want the government to have anything to do with it. And she's making that argument here. And of course, also arguing against her taxes going up. Um, but she's also taking a swipe at people like Jeanette Rankin, uh, who was unmarried and didn't have children. Why should someone like her want to bring about this bill? She's not a mother. And may, may be taking a swipe at uh, some of the other uh, people that she sees, women that she sees uh, supporting the bill who um, maybe only have one child. Ah, there are no experts in childbirth. How about me? Uh, I don't know how many children. Uh, <laughs> Mrs. Mitchell had, all I know about her is uh, this letter from the National Archives to her congressman. Uh, I, I know nothing else about her, but uh, we know she apparently had at least two children because she says, if you have no child, you have no business advocating for this bill. And uh, if you only have one child, you have no business doing that either. But uh, such sentiments aside, Jeanette Rankin, sitting up in the visitor's gallery now that she's no longer a member of Congress uh, and uh, surrounded by many other uh, women who back passage of what becomes the Shepherd Towner Act. They're sitting there in the visitor's gal gallery in 1921 when the Shepherd Towner Act becomes law passed by both houses of Congress by large margins and signed into law by Ohioan, uh, the new president, Harding. So 
This law enacted in 1921, the brainchild of the first female uh, member of Congress, Jeanette Rankin. This law provides uh, five years of government, federal government support to 3,000, 3,000 child and maternal care centers that would be located across the country. And it also provided federal funds for an extensive visiting nurses program uh, so there could be follow-up care after birth. So uh, women would come to the clinics, give birth, and then there would be follow-up care once they took their babies back home. This is a system that uh, is probably familiar to many of you who know uh, how childbirth works in uh, many places in, in Europe. Uh, but this was new here in the U.S. and uh, short-lived, but very successful. There was a significant improvement as a result of the Shepherd Towner Act, uh, significant improvement in maternal and infant mortality rates as a result of this act. And that was particularly in rural areas and among uh, women and children of color, i.e. Uh, not members of the white urban middle class uh, largely represented by these various women's organizations that are backing the law. Uh, this was truly uh, a public spirited law uh, in which women who could afford their own uh, obstetricians and uh, could uh, afford their own pediatricians, um, they were backing a law that would give federal funding to women who didn't have access. Uh, because of their location or uh, their family budget to these kinds of services. But remember, uh, the law only gave five years worth of funding for this program. By the time the act comes up for renewal in 1926, there has been a backlash. Now, remember after World War II, you're all familiar, there was a red scare in US society, uh, concern that there was too much communist influence in uh, post-World War II American society. Well, there was a smaller scale uh, post-World War I red scare. Uh, it seems that, uh, you know, these both these large scale international interventions on the part of the US uh, made people more isolationist minded in American society and were worried about um, international communism having uh, a greater influence in American society. And so uh, there were, there were uh, a series of backlash moments in American society by the time we get to the mid 1920s and backlash against um, laws such as the Shepherd Tanner Act People were accusing uh, the law of being creeping communism and its backers of being communists. In fact, uh, one member of the Utah uh, congressional delegation uh, called female supporters of the Shepherd Towner Act at the time when it was up for uh, renewal, financial renewal in 1926, uh, this particular uh, member of Congress called the women who supported it neurotic communists. And again, we see women on, on both sides. We see women affiliated with progressive uh, political organizations, uh, like the major Black women's political organization of the period, the National Association of Colored Women. We see them supporting renewal of uh, financing for Shepherd Towner but we see conservative organizations like the Daughters of the American Revolution and the Woman Patriot Corporation. These were both conservative women's organizations that had actually opposed uh, women's suffrage to begin with. They oppose renewal of Shepherd Tanner Act funding. And um, the suffrage uh, movement and uh, the women's movement itself is at a period where it is not as um, popularly uh, viewed as it was only a few years earlier at the time that the 19th Amendment became part of the Constitution. Um, who are these people like Crystal Eastman, 
Jeanette Rankin. Um, there were people who didn't want to see the vote as the beginning of uh, the story, but instead were quite comfortable with seeing it as the end. So um, suffragists and feminists uh, are in a period of some bad press at this time, as well as being suspect because uh, they are seen as being too affiliated with the political left. So in the end, Congress reaches a compromise. And rather than renewing the Shepherd Towner Act for another full five years, it is renewed, uh, its funding is renewed for only two and a half years. And so the Shepherd Towner Act finally expires in 1929. Um, and um, the infant and maternal mortality rates rise again. Again, perhaps um, an issue that sounds very contemporary. Among uh, the major industrialized nations, uh, the US still has a poor record, especially uh, for women and babies of color in terms of mortality rate. Well, the third uh, suffragist that I, I want to talk about this afternoon and examine her post 19th century career a bit. Uh, what was she doing in that uh, post suffrage decade is none other than Alice Paul. For some reason, my slide is not advancing. There we go. Um, Alice Paul, this is a photograph I shared this morning. She's sewing on that 36th star to her suffrage flag when Tennessee has ratified the 19th Amendment and has become part of the US Constitution. So uh, some of you saw this image uh, previously. What is she wanting to do now that suffrage is a reality? What is her uh, agenda following the suffrage amendment. Well, she is um, pretty straightforward. I see the natural follow up to the 19th amendment is what I would like to see as the next amendment to the constitution, an equal rights amendment to the constitution. And already only three years after the 19th amendment has become part of the Constitution, we see Alice Paul proposing an Equal Rights Amendment here in 1923. She comes up with the language herself. She sees this, as I noted a moment ago, a natural follow-up to the Suffrage Amendment and Equal Rights Amendment. The language that she constructs here for the amendment, and with some help um, from another member of her National Women's Party, the aforementioned Crystal Eastman. Um, the language is this, men and women shall have equal rights throughout the United States and every place subject to its jurisdiction. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Just two sentences. That's the proposed Equal Rights Amendment of 1923. Men and women shall have equal rights throughout the United States and every place subject to its jurisdiction. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. And now she needs to find a member of Congress who will introduce her proposed Equal Rights Amendment. Of course, Jeanette Rankin isn't there. She has to find a male uh, member of Congress who will sponsor the bill. And so, who better than a member of the House of Representatives from the state of Kansas, a Republican, Representative Daniel Anthony, Congressman from Kansas, nephew of Susan B. Anthony. So he introduces in the House of Representatives uh, an Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution. He introduces the proposed amendment on December 13th, 1923. And 
it will be introduced to every Congress for the next 50 years. Every Congress from 1923 to 1972. Some member of Congress will stand up and introduce an equal rights amendment to the Constitution. It never passes, however, both houses of Congress until we get to the early 1970s, uh, until 1971 and 1972. Uh, we have both houses of Congress, first the House and then the Senate, passing the Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution, which then goes to the states uh, for ratification by three fourths of the states. Now with the addition of Alaska and Hawaii, uh, women's uh, rights advocates have to get 38 states, not the 36 they needed for the 19th Amendment. They now need 38 states in the 1970s uh, to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment that Alice Paul has created way back in 1923. Uh, of course, you know how that story ends. By the time the final deadline for ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment comes about in 1982, only 35 of the necessary 38 states had ratified the amendment. So uh, three states short. As you also may recall, and again, it's so much to my advantage to be talking to the Lakeside audience because uh, many, if not all of you remember the 1970s and the early 1980s when I talked to my students here at Ohio University that might as well be talking about ancient Rome or something. Uh, but many of you probably recall that the chief opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment in the 1970s and in the 1980s came from other women, uh, not uh, the more progressive oriented women who supported the amendment, but conservative women led by Phyllis Schlafly and her organization, um, the Eagle Forum. And something similar actually had happened right out of the gate here in the 1920s. Uh, when the Equal Rights Amendment is proposed initially in 1923, um, opposition is coming primarily from women. Again, showing us that uh, women are not monolithic in their politics. Women did not become a monolithic voting block like the liquor industry had worried they would become. That is not the case. The Equal Rights Amendment goes down to defeat um, because, sure, there are some conservative women's organizations, like those I have already mentioned, the Woman Patriot Corporation, sort of a precursor to the Eagle Forum, will definitely be against the Equal Rights Amendment here in the 1920s, but progressive women's organizations will uh, will be as well. In fact, the League of Women Voters, the former NAWSA, the organization that had been the National American Woman Suffrage Association. Now, the League of Women Voters to help educate the newly enfranchised woman. The League of Women Voters goes on record against the proposed Equal Rights Amendment. Another major women's organization that had supported the suffrage amendment, the WCTU, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, is against the Equal Rights Amendment. The Women's Trade Union League is against the Equal Rights Amendment. The General Federation of Women's Clubs is against the Equal Rights Amendment here in the 1920s. And the National Consumers League is against the Equal Rights Amendment. What's going on here? Only two years ago, those very organizations, the League of Women Voters, the WCTU, the Women's Trade Union League, the General Federation of Women's Clubs, the National Consumers League, they were behind the Shepherd Towner Act, had been major supporters of that 
piece of pro uh, women legislation. Why against this proposed piece of legislation slash amendment? Again, the concern in part is about maternal health. Various of these organizations had backed laws that had been passed on the state level throughout the United States to protect women workers, working class women workers, women who worked in factory settings. A series of laws had been passed that had limited the working hours of women in, in factory-like settings and the types of um, work women could do in these settings in terms of, you know, uh, the amount of weight women could lift on the job, um, how long they could work in a standing position, this kind of thing. Protective labor legislation that the WCTU, uh, the uh, National Consumers League, all these progressive organizations had earlier in the 20th century, in the 1910s, these organizations had backed that kind of protective labor legislation for women, saying we have to protect women who um, are physical laborers from long work hours and difficult working positions that might imperil their health and thus their maternal health. Now, most of the women's organizations that had backed um, workplace protections for women workers would have backed this kind of legislation for male and female workers. Of course, not with the argument about maternal health uh, for male workers, but they believed that workers needed protection on the job. This was a major part of progressive era reform. We've got to protect American workers from dangers, uh, from long hours, low pay, dangerous working conditions in America's um, factories, meat packing plants, commercial laundries, et cetera. Members of the progressive movement of the early 20th century wanted these kinds of workplace protections put in place for all workers uh, but were only able to get laws on the books in the various of the 48 states uh, that would be recognized as constitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court in some important test cases when these laws applied to women workers exclusively with the argument, oh, but we've got to protect the women because we are protecting the future of our nation by protecting women's bodies uh, whose birth giving function could be put at risk if we have a generation of working class women who are not in good health because of work conditions. Uh, so the Supreme Court said, oh, we'll leave these uh, worker protection laws, particularly those limiting uh, workers to an eight hour or 10 hour workday if they apply uh, to women workers. Um, also, of course, behind the popularity uh, and the Supreme Court sanctioned legality of these laws that applied to female workers only was the idea that, well, you know, we don't want women to be direct competitors with men for the same jobs. So if we exclude women from certain hours of employment, and certain types of employment. They won't be competing um, with male working class laborers for the same jobs. And uh, many of the nation's labor unions backed uh, protective labor legislation specifically for women workers. Um, as I said, the Supreme Court had upheld these kinds of laws when they applied specifically and only to women workers. And so, uh, these various progressive women's organizations that uh, opposed Alice Paul's Equal Rights Amendment did so because they didn't want to see those protective labor laws 
put at risk. We worked so hard to get at least half uh, of our uh, population working in factory like settings uh, to be protected by workplace dangers and abuses. Uh, if we have an equal rights amendment, those laws will probably fall because uh, those are not laws that apply equally to men and women. An equal rights amendment would say that all workplace laws need to apply to both men and women. So we cannot support this amendment. So the equal rights amendment uh, was opposed by progressive women as well as conservative women. And Alice Paul never de did see passage of the ERA, even though um, she lives until 1977 and is active in uh, the campaign for an equal rights amendment uh, that emerges from what we popularly call the second wave uh, women's movement of the 1960s and the 1970s, finally with a new organized and high profile women's movement in the 60s and 70s. Um, there is uh, the will in Congress uh, to pass by wide margins in both houses uh, an equal rights amendment and then uh, most of the states, 35 states will ratify the amendment uh, and Alice Paul is there, not uh, going on hunger strikes any longer, for those of you who heard my comments this morning, but she's working the phones, uh, calling people, uh, you know, support, uh, calling lawmakers and voters, support the Equal Rights Amendment. And at the time, the final deadline uh, for ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment um, passes in 1982 five years after Alice Paul's death, 63% of the American population, a definite majority of the American population support the Equal Rights Amendment, including uh, that whole list of organizations that had opposed it back in 1923, the League of Women Voters, et cetera, support the Equal Rights Amendment by the time we get to the 70s and 80s. The Girl Scouts uh, support the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, what had changed? Well, of course, the New Deal of the 1930s had occurred. And uh, the kind of protective labor legislation that had only been upheld by the US Supreme Court for women workers uh, back in the 1920s, well, new laws are passed in the 1930s as part of President Roosevelt's New Deal that cover both male and female workers and ultimately uh, will be worker protection laws that the Supreme Court uh, approves of rules as constitutional for both men and women. And so there's not that risk any longer of uh, putting workplace reforms that only apply to women, uh, casting them into doubt. But still in 1982, just as in 1923, uh, women, conservative women, uh, women affiliated, especially with Phyllis Schlafly's Eagle Forum, um, are the primary opponents of an Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, in 1923, opposition had come from women on both the left and the right. Uh, by 1982, uh, it was coming specifically from the right. Uh, an Equal Rights Amendment instead had become a pretty mainstream idea, but a very vocal conservative minority uh, was able to stop ratification. And once again, particularly states in the South were um, reluctant to support passage of the amendment. And the idea of an equal rights amendment had become so mainstream that by the time we get to 1944, that election year, both the Democrats and the Republicans were supporting in their party platforms an equal rights amendment to the US Constitution. Um, we never achieved that, however. The, what I have called the growing pains of the post suffrage decade of the 1920s uh, show us how ambitious feminist and 
feminist, how ambitious, how ambitious feminist ambitions uh, had been, uh, how daring, how bold feminist ambitions, how ambitious the feminist agenda had been uh, in the aftermath of achieving the 19th Amendment. As Crystal Eastman said, freedom is a big word. And it is a word that certainly meant something different uh, from Alice Paul to Phyllis Schlafly. And women voters, not then nor now, are unified in defining what that word freedom means. And they are certainly not unified about how best to achieve freedom. Even um, in 1980, when what we now call the gender gap in American politics began to develop, uh, we still did not see a female blo voting bloc emerge. It's in 1980, for the first time since 1944, that the Republican Party does not go on record in their party platform of that year. Of course, 1980 is uh, the year that uh, Ronald Reagan will be elected president. It's the first time since 1944 that the Republican Party has been opposed in its platform to the Equal Rights Amendment. It is also uh, for the first time in many years that the Republican Party has gone on record against uh, reproductive rights, uh, specifically right to abortion. The Republican Party uh, with the so-called Reagan revolution is moving farther to the right. And um, people have argued, some observers have argued that all oh, the gender gap only begins in 1980 because of those stances taken by the uh, Reagan led Republican party that year. We will not endorse Roe v. Wade. We will not endorse uh, the equal rights amendment. And so more women leave the Republican party and go to the democratic. And in general, we have seen that kind of so-called gender gap with, uh, and we're talking primarily about the white population, of course, the white majority, uh, women of the white majority gravitating more to the Democratic Party, men of the white majority gravitating more to the Republican Party, and persons of color um, sometimes not being part of the system, of course, perhaps still. Uh, even by the 1980s, 90s, and into the 21st century being disenfranchised. Um, but for the most part, those who have voting rights, um, persons of color are also more gravitating toward the Democratic Party. So when we talk about the gender gap, it's a gender gap of white Americans. And uh, at a second glance, it's not so much really that more uh, white women are leaving the Republican Party and going to the Democratic Party, it is that more Southern white Democratic men are leaving the Democratic Party and going to the Republican Party. So the gender gap is caused more by white men leaving uh, the Democratic Party and going to the Republican Party, especially Southern white men. And also um, the majority of Southern white women this was a trend that had already begun with the Voting Rights Act of 1965, uh, which of course uh, became law through the efforts of a Democratic Southern president, President Johnson, and a democratically controlled Congress. Uh, the Voting Rights Act, which gave uh, Black voters in the South, finally, those voting rights that were initially, uh, on paper anyway, guaranteed to Black males, way back in 1870 with the 15th Amendment, and again on paper, guaranteed to uh, Black women with the 19th Amendment in 1920. It's only with the Voting Rights Act of 65 uh, that Blacks, male or female, have full voting rights in the American South. So um, Southern white Democrats are um, leaving the Democratic Party already uh, from 65 onward and are leaving it um, at a faster pace, especially men, after changes in the party platform, uh, moving uh, the Republican Party platform, moving more to the right 
uh, beginning in 1980, more to the right on social issues. Even so, even with the so-called gender gap between uh, men and women when it comes to white voters and a, a gender gap um, that is actually growing among uh, white voters here in the Trump era. Again, white women further gravitating to the Democrats and white men, uh, more to the Republicans. We still see uh, not a monolithic female vote. Uh, we see women voting perhaps sometimes according to gender interests, but also class interests, uh, racial ethnic interests, uh, regional interests. Um, the female voter, certainly not in uh, the post-suffrage decade of the 1920s, nor uh, today in 2020, um, the female voter uh, is not, um, cannot be pegged to be any one kind of voter. And we also see that many items on that post-suffrage agenda continue uh, to be on the agenda. Maternal and infant health. The question of who will or will not be given access to the vote supposedly guaranteed by the 15th Amendment, by the 19th Amendment. We're at a period of time when we're discussing again the issue of dis, uh, disenfranchisement, especially among voters of color as we see voter roll purges, uh, idea, I, D laws, uh, personal ID laws uh, being passed in various states. Um, we see um, competing philosophies of government, just as we did in the 1920s. So, so many of the issues uh, that came to the fore in that post 19th century, uh, excuse me, that post 19th amendment decade of the 20th century, the 1920s, so many of the issues and trends of that decade are with us still. In many ways, uh, we can argue that the growing pains of women's suffrage are still with us. And I think certainly recognize the truth of Crystal Eastman's words uh, that freedom is a big word and ask ourselves, have women yet achieved it a hundred years later? More than past time for me to be quiet and open things up for any questions or comments from my audience. Oh, for some reason, mine's, oh, there we go. Okay. I hear you. And now I see you. I can click and click and click. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you. That's, um, you know, a lot of times people will stop with their history of the suffrage movement right at the passage and not realize all the struggles that are continuing. Yes. And um, the, the history of the Equal Rights Amendment is just amazing to me that it's continued for so long and it has so many versions and evolutions and everything else. But um, I do hear it's funny, the Women's Club meeting um, that was happening at the same time, they're closing up now, so we might hear some people dropping in. Um, we don't have any questions on um, Facebook. We did have a couple people comment on your earlier morning program saying that uh, they wish they had been there when it was live. <laughs> so I would like to uh, remind everyone who is watching it, possibly at a later time, that we have uh, Dr. Jellison's contact information. So if you That's come right. across with any questions, um, we'd I love was, to connect you. I was just going to say that um, Dakota has my email address and I would love to hear from any of you. And um, I'm, I'm sure uh, that I left you with some questions and if questions about nothing else, um, maybe you have questions about further reading and I'm always happy yeah. to 
recommend for their articles and books uh, so you could learn more about the issues and themes that I spoke about. And uh, yesterday I uh, held up a few books here from my office and um, touted them. Mm -hmm. But I have uh, longer lists that I'd be happy to share by email. And we would love that. And just as a reminder too, um, as she was saying this morning, uh, Dr. Jellison is going to be taking part in a program that Ohio History Connection is putting on on uh, August 29th, um, the Ohio Women's Activism Virtual. Oh, it is just virtual. Okay. Um, and the link for that is is going up on our Lakeside page and Lakeside Facebook too, but it is at Ohio history.org. So I don't know if you want to say any more about that. Now. Well, just like so many events, it was supposed to be in person around mid-March. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, of course, was postponed because of the pandemic. And I will be talking with uh, three women who are activists here in the year 2020 in the state of Ohio. And they represent a diversity of, of women's activist activities uh, here in the 21st century. And these are three women who are showcased in the Ohio History Connections exhibit in honor of the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. And it's a great exhibit that uh, covers uh, Ohio women from the time of the suffrage amendment up till our own time. And uh, there are several women who are portrayed in that exhibit who are still with us and are eager to talk about their experiences. So I will be asking them a series of questions about their lives as 21st century activists. What a great way to tie everything in for this year, all the history and bringing it into the modern. So I'm looking forward to that. And the link is online for anyone else who wants to take a look. Thanks for putting and it again, up. Check out the exhibit too. Um, that Dr. Jellison helped with uh, building that for this year. But um, with that, we just really want to thank you for your time this week. Uh, you spent a lot of time with us and gave us a lot of information and many things to look into. So we appreciate it. It's your been my pleasure. I've enjoyed it. I would have enjoyed it more if uh, we hadn't mm -hmm. been under pandemic conditions, but I hope to visit Lakeside in person sometime. Mm -hmm. soon. And we would love that too. Okay. Um, and thank it's been you, everyone, a, been for a great uh, moderator, Dakota, and it's been nice to visit you through the computer screen. And I mm -hmm. hope I'll, I'll get a chance to meet you in person soon, too. I hope so, too. All right. Well, everyone, I hope you have a wonderful day, and we will...